Congress to dissolve? The Fed? I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. And with the Fed widely expected to raise policy rates tomorrow, Congress is making it clear to Powell that this time, you've gone too far. Let's over to Bloomberg, where we picked today's story up, with the Fed's employment mandate takes a back seat as it steps up its inflation fight. The Fed is rare among central banks for having employment mandate alongside a more traditional price stability mandate. The former is a byproduct of the civil rights movement, which fought for legislation ensuring adequate employment opportunities for all. The two objectives are widely seen as complementary. The conventional wisdom is that low and stable inflation allows businesses to focus on investment and hiring rather than worrying about raising their prices tomorrow. But in a sense, this is a challenge because this is a problem that the Fed has faced and has unsuccessfully been able to bring inflation down without raising unemployment. And now it's becoming front and center. But the Fed's balancing act becomes more difficult during bouts of high inflation. At those times, the tendency among policymakers has been to conflate the two mandates in a way that obscures the often painful trade-offs. And the reality is the best way to deal with inflation is to have a recession because it's really simple. People that lose their jobs and go on unemployment and have a third or half their income, they spend less. And if they spend less, consumption falls, inflation falls, and you win. And that's the challenge here because it's been made very clear by Powell that he's willing to sacrifice the jobs market to bring inflation down. But Congress is saying, no, no, no. This time, again, you've gone too far. In February 1981, when inflation was 11.4% and unemployment was 7.4%, then-Chair Paul Volcker told the Senate Committee on Banking that he was wholly convinced that given that the 4% unemployment target couldn't be reached, get the key words, in the short run, the kind of policies we are following offer the best prospect of returning the economy in time to a course where we can combine full employment as we can get with price stability. And what he was saying there is, look, I'm willing to sacrifice the labor market a bit to bring inflation down because of the long term, our data, our models say, bring inflation down, you'll create more jobs. He was willing to do it. And now so is Powell. By the end of the following year, unemployment had risen to almost 11%, the highest since the Great Depression, and it didn't return to 6% where it stood when Volcker took office in August of 1979 until he stepped down in August of 1987. And here's the reason why we see this. You know, when we look at a chart of consumer price index shown here in blue against the four-week moving average initial claims, we can note that throughout history, periods of rising inflation usually get met with rising unemployment. It seems inevitable. You can see it here again in the late 80s. We see it here going into the dot-com bubble. We see it again going into the great financial crisis. And we didn't quite see it here in late 2018 into 2020. But we know that unemployment, you know, initial claims started to bottom out and we're looking like they're about to head higher. But it's really an issue here because what happens, as we've talked about on the show, is that prices go up and wages don't keep up with it. And all of a sudden, discretionary spending falls, leads to higher unemployment. It just is a problem the central bankers can't get around. How do you bring inflation down without putting people on the unemployment line? They haven't figured it out. History says they ha can't figure it out. And sure enough, this time, now Congress is upset about what Powell's about to do. Today, Fed Chair Jerome Powell has a strikingly similar, similar message to Paul Volcker. At the September 21st PESH conference, he told reporters that re resorting to price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. And again, a key words there, longer run, where he was willing, and he is making it very clear, I'm willing to sacrifice the labor market in the short run to bring prices down because I think that will create more jobs in the future. The question then is, what if he's wrong? And as we saw in the last chart, any, once the unemployment claims start to build, they don't stop. They tend to keep going higher, even as inflation falls. Congress is figuring this out, and now they're making it very clear that he's gone too far, and the ramifications could be serious. Let's check this out. This letter from Sherrod Brown of the United States Senate Banking Committee. He says, as you know, the Federal Reserve is charged with a dual mandate of promoting maximum
maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates in the U.S. economy. It is your job to combat inflation, but at the same time, you must not lose sight of your responsibility to ensure we have full employment. So here you see from the big chief and the Senate Banking Committee that, hey, we're not too worried about this inflation problem. We're really concerned about this labor market issue. You blow that up. We've got serious problems. The letter goes on to say that Congress is working on bringing inflation down. The Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 was followed by the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022, both with hope to bring inflation down. I'll let you weigh on this one. Do you think Congress can bring inflation down? Or do you think they're the ones who created it and continue to create it with their spending habits? But do you think? I'd love to know. I'll let you weigh in the comments. Let's continue around. As around the world, central banks are also increasing interest rates to tame inflation. He says, unfortunately, there's a strong chance these simultaneous individual efforts will amplify each other, produce greater than intended consequences, or what he's suggesting here is a global recession, and he's spot on. He goes on to say that monetary policy tools take time to reduce inflation, and that's something that is true. We know that it hits the economy with a lag. We must avoid having our short-term advances, referring to the labor market, and strong labor market overwhelmed by the consequences of aggressive monetary actions, indicating that, hey, he's concerned. You keep doing this with these rates and bringing them up, people are going to be on the unemployment line, and that's a huge problem. He says, I ask you, don't forget your responsibility to promote maximum employment and that the decisions you make at the next FOMC meeting reflect your commitment to the dual mandate. Now, from this letter alone, does this mean that Congress is suddenly gonna get rid of the Fed? It doesn't, but what it does start to suggest to us that even though Powell was nominated and appointed by Congress or nominated by the president, appointed by the Senate with a majority that you can see this rift starting to break. And well, the risk here for the Fed isn't that they'll get rid of them. The risk is for the Fed is that in the future, Congress will take away more and more of their tools, leaving the Fed with almost no powers at all. But it wasn't the head of the banking committee alone who had an issue with Powell. Let's continue on. I write to urge the Federal Reserve to pause and seriously consider the negative consequences of, again, raising interest rates. The Fed's bluntest tool is the interest rate increases, and he asks, will raising interest rates lead to more oil? It won't. Will it lower the price of oil? Not directly. Will it create more food or lower prices of food? The answer is clearly not. In fact, the real risk is it'll make it worse. But here's one key thing, is when people make less money, when they lose their job, do they consume less oil? They do. Do they consume less food? Yes, in a sense, they actually do. They overall consume less, and that's how prices come down. And that's that's what Congress has to be afraid of here, because after all the pandemic spending, they don't have any way to save the economy. That's the problem here. And they're telling Powell very clearly, if you blow this thing up and we think you're going to, we can't fix it. And that means Powell gets on the chopping block. We both acknowledge there can be significant lag time between those actions and the full impact as long as six months to a year and a nod to the research by the great and late Milton Friedman. He go John Hickenlooper goes on to say, but the concern is the Fed is doing too much too quickly. He's got a big point here. It's already taken drastic action by raising rates by so much in a short period of time that we should wait to see the effects on the economy and how those changes are absorbed because we can go back and we can say we're right in the middle of this six to 12 month window. It won't be till January we start to pick up the first rate hikes from a year ago and they weren't that big. We kind of accelerated after that. And so the issue here we haven't seen the lags of monetary policy. And so what Congress is calling on now is to tell the Fed, we want you to pause, but are they going to? Well, not likely. In fact, not likely at all as we turn to Fed whisperer Nick Timroos of the Wall Street Journal, who seems to have all the answers ahead of time. Fed mean to focus on interest rates coming path. He notes another 75 basis point hike is baked in the cake that would take the federal funds to 3.75 to 4%. That would be the target range and mark their fourth consecutive increase. Some officials recently, as we've talked about on this show, have begun signaling their desire to start reducing the size of the increases after this week and potentially stop lifting rates early next year so they can see the effects on their moves. Again, suggesting that members of the FOMC are starting to get concerned that they've gone too far, too fast, and perhaps need to take a breather. 
Officials at their September meeting projected they would need to raise the rate by at least to 4.6 by early next year, which is referred to as the terminal rate. And so if we get to 3.75 to 4, that doesn't leave much margin now for the Fed to get to the terminal rate. You're talking, you know, uh, anywhere between a 50 and 75 basis point hike, and they're effectively there. So if you think about this from the Fed's perspective, they could go back now at their meeting tomorrow and say, look, we said we're about a terminal rate. And so we're going to be moving to either scale back the hikes or move to a position where they're going to get so small relative to what we've done that it will appear to be a pause. And if you don't think the market's going to get excited about that, oh, it will. If you have broad agreement on that and inflation keeps coming in higher than expected, it makes sense to get to that peak rate sooner, which means one potential last hike in December. But analysts at Deutsche Bank, UBS, and Credit Suisse and Nomura said no way. They're going to fall this week's 70 point five basis point hike with an increase of the same size in December. Meanwhile, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Evercor say no way. They're going down to 50 basis points in December. And there's an argument to that because officials will see two more months of economic reports. Now, mind you, the Fed doesn't have the CPI data going into this meeting we'll get that later this month but look at this even if powell provides guidance at his press conference it won't involve a commitment because again he doesn't have the data he needs to make that decision and that is a really good point but going forward b of a still says you know what it's no pivot in sight it's going higher and they think that the Fed is going to 5%, but something says perhaps that may not be true as bond rally with Fed's, with Powell's favored curve, poisoned for inversion, suggesting that the bond market is telling the Fed very clearly now, as we've been making the case on the show, that not only have you gone too far, you've gone to the point of no return, and now you need to stop. The rush for bonds comes as Chair Jerome Powell's favorite portion of the yield curve. The difference between where the three-month rates are now versus where they are expected to be in 18 months' time is on the cusp of inverting, meaning the three-month rates are lower than 10-year rates is what an inversion is. The inverted curve is a key warning sign for many investors that a recession is coming as the market begins to price in an end to tighter policy and braces for lower rates in the future to soften a blow of a looming slowdown. Many closely watched spreads in the treasury market have already flipped below zero as we've been covering on this show. And the other day we looked at the three month 10 year chart and note that every time that happens, every time it inverts where 10 year rates fall below three month rates, it means a recession is coming. And that is a key signal because Powell actually has acknowledged this in the past. So you know he's paying attention. In March, Powell downplayed the significance of two-year yields rising above 10-year rates, even though it has an 85% track record of telling the Fed they've gone too far, as it is an often cited hairbinger of a recession. He argued that traders were looking at the wrong metric and that if it's a shorter end measure, it gives a clear read because if it's inverted, it means the Fed's going to cut, which means the economy is weak. And so now you see the case where the Fed doesn't want to go into a position where they've hike, 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 and then cut, cut, cut. They don't want that to happen because it makes them look bad. So what's their only path to go forward now is to pause. And that debate is also being reflected by the Fed pricing as money markets have fully priced in the 75 basis point increase this week, meaning the likelihood of it happening is high. But still bets on yet another jumbo hike in December are wavering and are about 10 basis points lower than they were mid-October. Another widely followed yield curve, the gap between the three-month and 10-year treasuries, a note in the same article says, inverted for the first time since March of 2020. Again, if Powell is paying attention to the yield curve, and we know that he does, and if he's listening to the market, which is telling him, hey, it's time to pause, look for a message tomorrow that perhaps they're going to dial things down, and that, my friends, will be really bullish by the market's view. But does that mean the Fed's going away? Again, it doesn't. But if the Fed goes too far and blows this up, look for Congress again in the future to strip them of many of their monetary powers. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.